thank y'all. I'm so glad to be with you tonight. And I'm Brittany Byers. I am a uh, coordinating wildlife biologist uh, slash botanist, ecologist, whatever. I wear lots of titles and lots of hats. So um, I am in a partnership position. I have worked uh, primarily in, in private lands with landowners for most of my professional career. Uh, I started with Quail Forever back in 2013. Before then, I actually worked in Muhlenberg County, Kentucky at a Peabody Wildlife Management Area. Oh, goodness. Um, so I'm a quail biologist, uh, you know, prairie enthusiast, love grasslands, uh, all things grassland related. So um, a couple of years ago, several of us wrote a grant proposal for what's called an RCPP, the Regional Conservation Partnership Program through the Federal Farm Bill. Uh, and we, um, fortunately, it got approved. And so there's 11 partners on the, on the grant, but um, SGI and Quail Forever um, and the state agencies, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife and Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency are the, like the main partners. And it's a, it's a two state grant. So I work in Kentucky and Tennessee, both implementing this special, um, this special grasslands focused uh, grant or like funding mechanism for private lands. So private lands is the primary focus. Now I do work on other projects that are just SGI related. Like some of y'all might've heard about our Google Prairie project. Dunbar Cave State Park Prairie Project. Um, we've also got one at Paris Landing State Park and all those are in Tennessee, but still not too far from, from Kentucky. So, um, but when I started with QF, it was also in a joint position with NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So I used to work out of a USDA service center, uh, just like the NRCS folks. Now I just work from home. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of, of SGI or the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative for those of you that uh, still don't know a whole lot about it. First of all, we have a real, really strong uh, Facebook following and a really good Facebook page. So if any of y'all are not following SGI on social media, please do so if you're interested. We try to post frequently and uh, lots of uh, just great information on there. So this is our, uh, our uh, footprint, so to speak. And of course, SGI got started in 2018. So we're still new and we're relying heavily on, um, you know, donations, you know, we do a lot of philanthropy um, and we're, we uh, heavily rely on partnerships like with Quail Forever and NRCS and and also private entities and uh, land trusts and, um, you know, working jointly with state wildlife agencies or, or natural areas, divisions, uh, you know, entities that, like that. But eventually we are hoping that we have uh, coordinating biologists and or ecologists throughout all of the uh, Southeastern grasslands Eco region. So that's what this uh, map is displaying here. Um, but, and we are growing. Uh, there are three of us coordinating biologists in Tennessee. One's based out of Chattanooga. Um, Cooper Breeden, I don't know if any of y'all have heard of him, but he uh, works out of Nashville. And of course, I live in West Tennessee, but cover, you know, Kentucky, most of Kentucky and, and most of Tennessee as well. Uh, and then we have a new coordinator in Georgia um, that's in a partnership. He's in a partnership with the uh, um, University of Georgia and the uh, Botanical Garden down there. So uh, we also have a chief ecologist in Arkansas. And um, hopefully we will continue to grow. So um, I wish Dwayne had sent me a well-defined grassland map of Kentucky, but since y'all are close, we'll at least talk about Tennessee for a minute. But these are the um, 
what we consider grasslands of Tennessee, and, and we use the term grasslands in a very broad sense. Uh, some folks kind of argue with, with our terminology, but when we use the term grasslands, we're talking about prairies, barrens, glades, river scours, bogs, fens, savannas, and, and even woodlands. So that's what you're seeing there. And, you know, the point of this map is just to show uh, how vast and, and expansive grasslands were in Tennessee. And it's very similar for Kentucky as well. Here's one that's a little more defined for Middle Tennessee specifically. And as you see that Northern border of Kentucky, that's all the, uh, you know, Penny Royal Plain there um, that used to be, oh, several hundred thousand acres uh, of nothing but prairie. Um, Fort Campbell is pretty much the last stronghold for that. So we've got a little, a few pockets and areas here and there, and hopefully we can start to get it back. All right, so uh, for those of you that have heard Dr. Dwayne S to speak, he's uh, kind of like, um, he's not my official boss, but he kind of is, and definitely a great mentor. He always likes to talk about his uh, Tommy Johns, his history professor from like the sixth grade, you know, his, his middle, middle school stories and the fabled squirrel, how so many of us were taught that um, in the Eastern US, even specifically the Southeast, that it was just uh, all just uh, contiguous hardwood forests and pines and that the squirrel could hop from tree to tree and just get from one side of the south to the other from east to west and and obviously that's not the case based on a lot of research and historical records that Dwayne has spent a ton of time uh, searching for and digging through even in his own free time so And, uh, and uh, like he says, Tommy John's never talked about grasslands. And this is an old map that um, was created with the, the notion that this is where the majority of the grasslands were in the United States. Um, and for example, I won't read this whole quote, but you know, we used to have, uh, greater prairie chickens in the Penny Royal Plain. So, so why do we know so little about Southeastern grasslands? Well, honestly, it's because uh, primarily from development, agriculture, um, you know, folks trying to make a living during the pioneer expansion, and there's a very common misconception about our crop fields and agricultural lands in the Southeast that there were hardwoods there and they were cut down in order to farm the areas. And that was probably true in some cases, but actually the most fertile land um, was prairie historically. And of course, the pioneers were smart and they're not going to cut down a bunch of trees when they can plow up a prairie, you know, just like they did in the Midwestern states. It's very similar to the Southeast. So, and the savannas succeeded to forests. So the, the prairies were plowed up to plant crops and we lost um, the natural fires that and grazing that kept these um, savannas and woodlands maintained and open, you know, because historically we had bison and elk and of course white-tailed deer too. Um, and uh, they definitely helped to keep that understory growth down and fire was a, a frequent occurrence, either from lightning strikes and or from Native Americans managing for those ungulates that they were hunting. 
such as the bison and elk. And like I said, arable lands were converted to croplands. And this is the reason why Tommy never taught us about southeastern grasslands. So uh, as I'm facing the map, the one on the left, that's an, a, another old, uh, very um, inaccurate, outdated map of what uh, used to be thought of as grasslands in the south. And of course, you can see the Pennyroyal Plain up there, that little U shape. Um, and then we've got the Black Belt Prairie of Mississippi and Alabama. And then also Black Belt regions in Arkansas and Louisiana and Texas, and then the prairies in uh, Florida. But the map to my right uh, is much more accurate. And you can see the huge difference between these two where grasslands truly occurred in the Southeast. So how do we know grasslands were so expansive? Well, oh, lots of historical records, like I mentioned. Uh, you know, it, Dwayne, especially he'll look for clues like good pasture ground, the term savanna in, in these old maps. Uh, the other thing that you'll often see is um, on those old plat maps, it'll say something like um, steak steak, oak tree steak. And so that gives us an indication that they had to put stakes down because it was all open. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. Now, here's some examples of what we consider grasslands. Like I said, we use that in the broad sense. Um, you can see all those pretty pictures there. And then um, if any of y'all are not familiar, I keep hitting my button, sorry. With the, the book, uh, Forgotten Grasslands of the South, uh, I highly recommend reading this. Uh, Dr. Reed Noss from Florida. Uh, he's also a SGI contributor and collaborator. Um, it's just a phenomenal book. So I highly recommend it. Here are some photos from Dr. Reed Noss there, from the Florida prairies. All right, so to continue the uh, explanation of why grasslands are so important, um, you know, for example, in this um, savanna here in North Carolina, there were 52 species in one square meter. So, uh, and you know, that, that level of diversity doesn't necessarily occur in all the grasslands in the Southeast, but here's a point that we strongly emphasize and explain a lot, that the level of endemism or, um, you know, speciation, plants and wildlife, especially plants, that level is the highest in the Southeast than anywhere else in the country. Uh, for example, I'm sure y'all are familiar with blazing stars, the genus Liatris. There's only, you know, a few species of those that occur in um, the prairies in the Midwest and, and, and farther out west in the U.S. And in the Southeast, I honestly couldn't even tell you how many, but it's, it's probably 10 or more. So just using Liatris as an example. Um, also Asclepius, the genus for milkweeds. Oh my goodness, there are so many native milkweeds in the Southeast that are just stunning, just gorgeous and serve such a vital purpose for pollinators and wildlife. So here's some grassland dependent species, you know, blackjack oaks, uh, post oaks, and we often, you know, we use these mature trees as current clues. It may be shaded and completely, you know, not much understory growth at all, but if we're seeing post oaks and blackjack oaks and 
a few others, that's a great indicator. World sunflower, um, that's a species that is in totally imperiled. Uh, there's only two small populations in Southwest Tennessee left. Um, I'm, we're hoping we can save it. A lot of us have been working on conservation efforts and plans for that one. Meadow jumping mouse, Inslow sparrows, prairie moth, etc. So, another point that we make is that um, grasslands are definitely restorable. And the low hanging fruit are these areas that were savannas and woodlands historically that have, uh, you know, closed in because of lack of fire. So that's what it could look like with fire and some thinning of the uh, species that are not adapted to fire, for example. That's where you start first when we make thinning recommendations for landowners. And that's Catuso um, Wildlife Management Area in, in Tennessee. They're doing a prescribed burn in the shortleaf pine savanna restoration. So what gives us hope about these savannas and woodlands especially is that the seed banks and rootstocks are often still intact. Um, Dwayne stresses a lot that we are on the verge of losing the shelf life. Um, most of the time they're still intact, but of course seeds have a shelf life. You know, they only stay viable for so long. So it's up to us to encourage folks to do the restoration work. Sorry guys, I keep having to move this around to see my slides. So take home message, we can't afford to let our, let the last remnants we have slip away. I see some pretty pictures there. Plant biodiversity, uh, 60% of plant biodiversity are grassland dependent plants. Uh, 34% for animal biodiversity. And then um, I'll also explain that with this RCPP that I am implementing, um, like I said, grasslands are the focus. And then we have three um, focal species, three grassland birds that we are targeting and really trying to encourage landowners to properly manage for or do restoration work for. And the one that's the most critical of the three is the Henslow Sparrow. And here's some pictures of them. And they're a true grassland dependent species. They have to have 80 contiguous acres of native grass prairie. Well, that one's a little harder to manage for on private lands, but there are still some folks that um, manage, you know, that own enough acreage to manage for them. And then this cute little guy, um, our eastern meadow larks, that used to be so much more common than they are now, and their populations have totally plummeted. I did bird surveys when I was in college about 17 years ago, and uh, this was one of the most common species that I recorded. And um, we gotta we gotta do something to help them for sure. They've declined; their populations have declined by eighty percent in their in their whole range. And then our northern bobwhite. 
also a grassland species. So that's our third vocal species. So why have they declined? Some of these things I've already mentioned. Um, fire management has widely been abandoned. Grazing lands converted to clump farming, forage to aggressive sod forming, exotic grasses. So, you know, uh, like I'll use the Cumberland Plateau, for example, historically, even back in like the 50s and 60s, there were folks that were livestock farmers um, that would just let their cattle graze the native grasses that just occurred there naturally. Um, and a lot of that's been converted, unfortunately, but um, native grasses were still very much prevalent in a, a lot of the South. And when cattle were introduced, that's what they were grazing on. Too much manicured mowing. Uh, gosh, I'm sure you all really have a time trying to emphasize why we don't need to just mow and manicure everything to death. Um, obviously, row crop fields are much cleaner. Um, we like to use the term uh, bush hog disease <laughs> for folks that just they don't have anything else to do or farmers that get done planting and they just want everything to be clean. Um, you know, you can look around any landscape in this in the southeast and see that the shrubby fence rows that were great escape cover for bobwhite quail are, are not there anymore and those weedy patches. Um, obviously higher levels of pesticides that are indirectly targeting the wrong species, especially pollinators. Um, yeah, so for woodland and uh, savanna management, it's either been too intensive or not intensive enough. Um, you know, they either, folks hire a logger and they take out all the important species uh, or it's, it's left to grow up too much and needs to be burned and thinned, so. But uh, despite the uh, downfalls and all the challenges grassland species have faced, have, have faced their renewed interest. Um, hopefully y'all are seeing that as well. Um, but, you know, SGI tries to educate and, and do outreach and, and Quail Forever does too with every opportunity possible. So, and uh, that's possible by the partners. So here's a few pretty pictures of some uh, remnants since um, we're talking about areas that are still around and intact and, you know, thinking about it from a positive standpoint. This is in Coffee County, Tennessee, uh, where Manchester is, so southern middle Tennessee. Um, but you could see a lot of these same species in the prairie remnants in Kentucky as well. Uh, Here's one from, from Rutherford County uh, where uh, Murfreesboro is. Uh, power line prairie, uh, power lines are also extremely important. Um, SGI has uh, got a lot of plans and uh, actually funding for uh, a seed program. Um, so we're really trying to focus on seed collection and storage and, and propagation so that we don't lose some of these species altogether. And these power line rights of way are uh, definitely strongholds for some of these more rare species that we're, we're trying hard to conserve. Uh, there's a wet limestone glade in Wilson County, Tennessee. So a lot of folks don't realize that uh, there are some glades that have hydric soil pockets in them that are like little micro wetlands. And you'll see all kinds of true wetland plants in, in these little um, small pocket areas. So um, 
this is one of my favorite places I've ever visited. Um, this is in Nelson County, Kentucky. Uh, this is a former coworker of mine. And I, um, this is actually an Abbey. Uh, I always have trouble pronouncing the name. Y'all are probably familiar with it, but um, we can talk about it after y'all are off mute. <laughs> uh, but anyway, <clears throat> This is a, a site that we made recommendations for, um, you know, more burning. Um, it, as you can see in the background here, lots of Eastern red cedar encroachment. I am 110% positive if someone went in there, cut those down, reintroduced fire, um, they would have these prairie dock and little blue stem, big blue stem, uh, gray headed comb flower, um, Here's some liatris blazing star down here, the scaly blazing star. Um, and then there's Echinacea simulata, the, one of the um, purple cone flowers. So these are all um, definitely sp species that are not nearly as common, uh, definitely have conservation concerns. So, all right, so switching gears, because Trina and I talked about, okay, now what, what can I help y'all with on a smaller scale, just like backyard, you know, basically like small prairie patches, pollinator habitat, plots, things like that. So we'll kind of going from like big picture concept to uh, down to like the technical details of what you all can do to, to help. So, all right, so, from our side of things, we try to offer as much and as you know detailed advice as possible. And you know, like I said, I'm working with landowners that own property on a larger scale, but that doesn't mean that having a one acre yard uh, that you couldn't benefit something. My yard is uh, like 1.2 acres, and I have um, pollinator habitat in like four different places in my yard. So, all right, but what, what we start with is designing a good seed mix if you need a seed mix. Now, oftentimes if you're a homeowner, you do have to do some things, you know, just because of who owned it previously and the fact that it was in a sod forming grass. Um, so most of the time you would need to plant a native species mix that hopefully that is endemic to your area. Um, but in some cases, if you can do some things to target the species that don't belong there and natural regeneration is an option, then uh, you know that's, that is most ideal. If you already think you have a seed bank to work with, oh, that's wonderful. But again, it depends on you know, your, your eco region, what the land use history is for your area, things like that. All right. So what do we consider when we're starting this process? The natural field or your yard conditions, even if you're doing a small patch, it's still a good idea for you to try to find out your soil types. And there's a free website, the Web Soil Survey, that you can Google and get a free map um, you know, if you can find your property um, on their aerial imagery, you can figure out your, your soil types. So when we're designing something for a landowner, we don't ever proceed without trying to know that first. Like I said, consider the native flora in your eco region. Design with competition and or erosion in mind. You know, again, that's more of like a landowner recommendation if you're planting on a larger scale, but definitely something to think about too. Um, all right, so bloom periods. That's something that we talk about a lot um, with, with the public. Um, to have true pollinator habitat, you would want something that blooms in the spring or early summer, mid summer, and then late summer to fall. That way you are providing 
good strong nectar sources all throughout the growing season. Um, consider adding early blooming shrubs. Um, you know, you can easily landscape with some pretty native shrubs. One of my favorites is Chickasaw plum. Absolutely love that one. Um, Mexican plum is also probably native to uh, parts of Kentucky. It is to Tennessee. Uh, that's, that's definitely like a glade type species. Um, anyway, so just think about that because the shrubs typically bloom way before any of the wildflowers do. And then here's an example of a web soil survey map. Um, so the cool thing is on the map, it's gonna show you uh, the different soil types. And then it also generates a report for you and gives a description of each of your soil types for your AOI, the area of interest. And I apologize if some of y'all already know about this, but it's just kind of important. All right, so what else do we consider? Uh, we consider diversity. Uh, you know, when we're designing seed mixes, of course, everyone's got a budget. Everybody's got, you know, financial limitations like you know, well, I can spend X amount and that's great. We totally understand that. And we work with landowners within their financial means all the time. Um, but if you can afford a really nice 20 plus species mix, uh, that would be ideal. Think about color, insect attraction, obviously landowner perception, monarch conservation, try to include, you know, anything under the milkweed genus Asclepius for host plants and nectar sources for monarchs and other pollinators. And um, yeah, milkweeds are definitely pricey, um, but it's gotten better. They're still kind of expensive when you plant from seed, um, but that's because of what the native seed companies have to do in order to uh, keep those plants alive and keep keep them from getting consumed by the you know milkweed bugs and other insects that that also feed on them and it's just a lot it's very labor intensive so that's the reason why the seeds a little more expensive um anyway all right so what else do we think about um, and obviously some of these steps that I've put in this slide are more for something that we're considering uh, as the planner or the person that's assisting a landowner with the mix. Um, you have to consider, are you planting it with a no-till drill or are you broadcasting? And I'm sure in, in nearly all of your cases, you would, you would need to broadcast unless you're planting plugs. And, and that is completely fine if plugs are something that you have available and um, you know, you've got native nursery vendors available. And I think I heard somebody mention something about that on the beginning of the call. So um, it's just whatever you prefer, whatever you can afford, things like that. But I have done all of mine from seed. All right, okay. So one of the things that we do consider, especially for planting with the drill, is fluffy versus slick seeds. Sometimes that, we, that can cause us problems, but probably not anything for you all to have to worry about unless any of you are own property that on a larger scale and you're thinking about doing some restoration work. So species selection for wildlife, in addition to pollinators, you know, think about brood habitat for bob whites, especially, uh, and good brood habitat is pollinator habitat. Lots of wildflowers, some native grasses for nesting material, but they don't necessarily have to have a lot of native grasses like what was formerly um, thought about bob whites. Uh, can, you know, consider including legumes. Um, especially if you're trying to attract other wildlife, you know, we like to eat beans and peas and so do the critters. So structure, um, like I said, adequate nesting material. Um, 
And one thing that I talk a lot about is the natural regeneration that occurs among uh, what you planted. That's all, a lot of times it's good. Like um, if y'all are familiar with uh, the genus Eupatorium, the bone sets, a lot of times those will come up on their own um, and you don't have to put them in a seed mix or partridge pea. Um, you know, of course you wouldn't want any of those to necessarily be competitive, but a lot of times they'll just come in just from some, a little bit of soil disturbance. So it can be beneficial. All right, so what else do we consider? Now, these are just some examples. Um, Here's some that are quick to germinate, obviously black-eyed Susan, partridge pea, landsleaf coreopsis, all the native coreopsis. There's also coreopsis major and, and tinctoria. Those are really good. Uh, showy tick seed. Um, all right, so which ones are slower to germinate? And we talk about this a lot because especially you know everybody wants to see something come up you know at, right, soon after you plant it from seed and so we have to stress patience a lot and I even have to remind myself that <laughs> with my own planting so a uh, rattlesnake master any of the blazing stars the silphiums rosin weeds um tall coreopsis is a little slower to come up golden uh, golden alexander's um, and then sometimes the tridiscantias, the uh, spider warts, sometimes it takes them a little bit to se several years to come up after, if you've planted from seed. So those are just things to be mindful of. Um, yeah, so there's a rule of thumb with the basil leaves and like how much space a wildflower occupies when planted from seed. If it's really, if it's a really small, tiny seed, like for example, I'm sure y'all know about bee balm or like the mountain mints. Those seeds are super, super tiny, like several million seeds per pound. And so their footprint, so to speak, is very small too whenever they're planted. So we talk about this and I'm mentioning it now because if you plant those species, very small speeded, spe seeded species, um, you, you have to have enough in the mix for them to, um, to thrive and germinate. Because if they're really small, when they sprout up, they're also going to get outcompeted. So be mindful of that. If you want help or you decide, decide to design a seed mix is what I'm saying. All right, and the opposite is true for larger seeded species, uh, just generally speaking. And you know, more of the larger seeded species, you know, that'd be like the, the uh, milkweeds, they've got a pretty large seed. So, um, yep, ties in with the natural survivability. So in other words, if you've got something that's spitting out lots of tiny seeds, um, it's doing that for a reason because it's a more sensitive species as opposed to one that's larger and more robust. So consider dormancy. Um, yeah, so we talk a lot about um, planting times uh, and this might be something that you all know about already but the whole frost seeding concept, you know, when the, the native seeds go through a good freeze and thaw cycle. And of course you could mimic that by putting them in your freezer. Um, but yeah, most of them need to be cold stratified. So um, I've planted some of my plots in the winter and planted some in the spring. It doesn't mean that you, you won't have a successful planting in the spring, but I have found time and time again that when seeds are broadcasted, or drilled like in December, January, or February, they germinate so much quicker than if they were planted in April or May or June, for example. So kind of gives them a, a head start because you're always going to face some degree of competition when you're planting something from seed, a, you know, native 
flowers and grasses from seed. Mm. Yep, and then some do better planted in the spring, such as the milkweeds, for example. But most of them do well if they're planted in the, in the dormant season. All right, so think about what's competitive and what's not. That's something else that we talk a lot about. Uh, even though these species are native and also ecotypes can help minimize this as well. Um, Cause you know, for example, if you're, if you have a little switchgrass or big blue stem in your mix and it came from, you know, the Midwest, it may, you know, behave differently from our local ecotypes. And it, it does actually. Um, I've looked at and, and managed a lot of CRP uh, acreage in Tennessee, the Conservation Reserve Program. And uh, some of these native grasses that they planted 10 and 20 years ago can just completely get too thick and take over. And they were all like Midwestern ecotypes. So it's just something that we're mindful of and that we try to educate folks on. Um, but alternatively, there's lots of native species that don't behave competitively. And it's not that we shy away from the ones that can be competitive. It's all about a balance, you know. You know, you just don't want to put too much of these in a seed mix, for example. So. And here's just a quick example of our different planting methods. That's I'm calibrating a no-till drill there for um a large CRP planting that we did in uh, West Tennessee. And then there's a good example of um, broadcasting there in the middle, which works very well. As long as you do your, your site preparation, um, do a good job of that first, then you'll be successful. So here are my sweet children. Um, and this is my own yard that I like to use for an example here what y'all can do. Um, so my husband uh, discs this up for me and then that's my daughter Lily. She's broadcasting the native seed that we had. Um, this is my little boy Nolan here. He's also trying to assist. <laughs> um, in the background this is my husband and my oldest daughter Darby and then so after you <clears throat> disc and broadcast, it's important, especially if you're planting, well, it doesn't matter, even if it's winter or spring. Um, you know, on large scale plantings, we tell folks to cultipack after the seed's been broadcasted. In this case, we're using a yard roller. Uh, works great. And this step is pretty important because you want to make sure that the seed binds well to the soil. And if you know, if, you, if any of y'all have planted native plants from seed, um, they do not, they're not planted deep at all. It's just barely on the surface. You just want them to just be able to, to stick to the soil and then you're good. So we've had many failed plantings from landowners that didn't get assistance and used a no-till drill and drilled the seed way too deep. And then they didn't get hardly anything that came up. So. So, questions, uh, if you want to check out our websites, I encourage you to do so. Um, so now we can have discussion time. Based on our definition, when, when we use the term grassland, think about it like an umbrella. And then there are like subcategories underneath the term grassland. And prairie would be one of those, just like a savanna or a glade or a bog, just, just for example. So grassland is like, we use that term in a very broad sense. Not very much. Okay. Uh, you could, you know, 
I have them in, in this small field next to my house when they don't scalp it to death. Um, but it's only like five acres. Meadowlarks are just, they are such generalists. And that's why it's so scary that they've declined so much because they just don't have super specific habitat needs. They can nest and thrive in a cattle pasture uh, in somebody's grown up yard. I mean, they're just so versatile. And um, that's what has us worried, you know. So there's no specific plant they're looking for, nothing? Not really. Uh, but they, they even do okay in like old fescue pastures. They're just, yeah. I don't know, neat that way. But um, yeah, like they could survive on five or six acres, honestly. Okay. Because I've got yeah. five acres and I've been hoping to see them come to my house. There and, you go. And they haven't nested here. So. Okay. Don't give up. <laughs> There's kind of two answers to that question. If you're managing for quail, for example, on a larger scale, you wouldn't necessarily want to plant shrubs up against the hardwood edge because the shrub area is their safety zone. And we don't, we try to shy away from the whole predator topic because it sometimes gives landowners the wrong impression. But um, avian predators do perch in those mature hardwood trees and so they will basically pick off the quail if you were to put the shrub hedgerow up next to the wood line but we do encourage other things like what we call edge feathering um, where you have kind of like um, what we call zones where like uh, on the edge of the woods, like where the open field is, 50 feet in, let's say you take out 50% of the hardwoods in that edge. So you're opening up the canopy and you are creating a transition zone between your open field and your mature tall hardwoods so that it's like a gradual thing. It's almost like you're, you're creating a midly up uh, a mini woodland or savanna, you know, between your field and the mature hardwoods. And in that case, if it's on a large scale, like, you know, 10 plus acres, that's what I would recommend to a landowner. But if it's on a smaller scale, you know, like your backyard or something, there's absolutely nothing wrong with planting some pretty shrubs up against your woods. That is totally fine, you know. Because it's not like you're going to have quail hanging out in a more not urban area, but, you know, um, where your yard's not as big. So that's why I said there's like two answers to that question. <laughs> that, like the average home range for a male bobwhite is 20 to 30 acres. So it's not as huge as a Henslow Sparrow where they need 80 plus. Um, but in order to actually hold a covey and some nesting pairs, you know, you would, you, you typically want like around 20 acres. But um, what we explain, especially to folks, you know, a lot of our landowners like to hunt recreational hunting and stuff. And so uh, if you're managing for bob whites, you can also do good for deer and, and turkey uh, and of course, lots of different songbirds and stuff. Um, because those other game species are more habitat generalist, whereas quail have more specific needs. It's kind of like uh, in between how finicky the Henslow sparrow is and the meadow lark that's super generalist. So bob whites need lots of wildflowers that attract insects because that's what the chicks feed on all throughout the growing season because they have to really put on that protein to survive through the up, you know, for the upcoming winter. Uh, and their number one lacking habitat component is a scape cover. Uh, they just don't have enough. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like actual woody shrubs. It could be a blackberry patch, um, a wood, like a natural wood piles, anything to where they can get away from a predator. Um, that is so 
lacking. It's so absent, you know, in the, the quail range. And so when I'm meeting with landowners and they'll tell me things like, well, I used to have all these coveys and now they're all disappeared, but my property looks the same as it did 20 years ago. Does it? <laughs> You don't have any fence rows anymore. You know, there you you've taken out your sumac patches. And you know, it's not a criticism. They just don't think about that, you know. So they really have to have those places to hide. They gotta have lots of wildflowers. They don't necessarily have to have grasses because they can, based on the latest research and science, they can nest in just about anything. They don't necessarily have to have grasses. Um but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. As long as they've got a good escape cover and lots of wildflowers um, and good height, you know, even in the brood habitat where the flowers are, um, it's got to be kind of bare underneath where the chicks can maneuver around, which is why they don't do well in pastures like Bermuda grass and, and thick fescue because the chicks cannot get around in that. Uh, which is why native grasses were emphasized so much, you know, in recent years. But as long as there's a little bit of bare ground component there uh, and they got some escape cover and some good wildflowers, then, then they'll be in good shape. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Margaret asks, why does burning encourage grasslands? And I would add, how often should I burn my tall grass patch? Yeah, great questions. So the reason why it's important, and there's several reasons. Um, first, number one, first of all, the grasslands in the Southeast very much evolved with fire, just like they did with the Midwestern prairies. So a lot of them are actually fire dependent. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, especially when fires would naturally occur in the fall or winter, it would stimulate this the upcoming you know seed germination so it would scarify the seed coat or essentially scratch it or take it away so that it was able to germinate for the next growing season uh, um <clears throat> yeah so that's you know the primary reason um it also is important to set back succession so just like with those pictures I was showing when you take the fire away and it becomes this closed canopy forest where there's not much growing in the understory. You know, fire keeps other species from encroaching. And that's why some of our oaks do well like blackjack and post because they also evolved with fire. In the deeper south, if y'all have ever heard of wire grass, you know, like Southern uh, Georgia and Florida, um, it has to have fire because like the seed actually pops off of the grass um, after fire has run through and like run its course. So, um, and it's just, it's important to keep those landscapes open that were naturally open for, you know, things like gopher tortoises, not just, you know, birds, but you know, all kinds of, and there's like, all kinds of other herps and species that have to have that, you know, if you think about it, sunlight is, is coming down to the forest floor after you've opened up the canopy again and you are letting diversity reestablish because you, you're not going to have very many species, plants growing in the understory um, because there's too much shade. But once you thin and burn again, it's like it comes back. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I think I think that helps us figure it out. Um, I have yeah. a patch that's about 20 by 40 feet where I put in a uh, tall blue stem and Indian grass and everything. Yeah. And then one year I burned it, one year I raked it off, and last year I didn't do anything. Okay. How do I manage this? Uh, what, what should I be, should be doing with it? Yeah, yeah. So... Um, have you got wildflowers in there too, or is it just uh, mostly some, grass? I mean, I started with all grass and then realized I want some flowers. So yeah. I put them in later, but okay. mostly grass. Okay. All right. So since you want to have a good mix of both, the best thing to do 
to kind of knock your grasses back a little bit so that you've got space for your wildflowers. Mm-hmm. Burn it in September, early October. Do it in the fall because anytime you burn in uh, sometimes like late winter or early spring, it facilitates more grass growth. Um, it, because sometimes there were, well, burning in the spring helps those like the base of the grass clumps, um, it like invigorates them. So they'll grow more and more, which is why the livestock producers that will plant native grasses for forage, we encourage that for them. Like we want them to keep their grasses maintained. So we'll talk to them about like patch burn grazing in the spring. But in your case, especially if you want more wildflowers, burn it in the fall before everything goes dormant. So like before the first frost happens. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, every and year, then, every other year, what's the cycle? Yeah, yeah. So every other year is totally fine. Okay. It's, it's like that slide that I, I had pulled up with like all the reasons for most, you know, the grassland birds declined. Um, urban sprawl um you know poorly managed pastures uh mowing honestly mowing is probably one of the top reasons because like i said they do fine but they've got to have some kind of structure to nest in and something to allow insects in it and if you've scalped everything you know what what do they have so yeah so and the lack of food source. The food, sorry, the food source is a big thing too, just because like I talked about um, overuse of pesticides and it affecting, you know, bug and pollinator populations that's affected so many birds, you know, cause that's what they, that's what they eat. Right. So I'm sorry, some, you started, somebody started I asking think Trina's, questions. Trina had a question. Okay. Yeah. This is Trina. I had a question. So years ago, I went to a quail habitat training thing and talked about doing a third brushy shrubby, three to five feet, a third full sun, and a third wooded. And something I read hmm. recently said I should be looking around my area to see what's missing because there is lots of woods, um, mm-hmm. not as much old field and not as much shrubby brushy. So that's what I was going to focus on. I have 11 acres. That's what I was going to okay. focus on. Yeah. But uh, is, that, is that what you think is i should do or you know i think what would help you could could well of course jeremy's supposed to come out there and look at that can you send me some pictures oh sure sure and i've had my property burned before by the division of forestry they lost control of the fire and accidentally burned part of my neighbor's property bless their hearts um but it really helped with i've got lots of native plants i've just let it get too overgrown so yeah i got gotcha. you yeah, so, but yeah, so I can send you some pictures um, mm-hmm. of what I with cutting down trees. But yeah, it's hard to know what I should leave and stuff. Because I used to, six years ago, I had American woodcocks, like three pairs with oh. little, with your Bob White. Nothing. I mean, the huh. yellow breast crack is gone. The indigo bunnings. I mean, I've really not done a great job. Oh, man. That. So I want to bring, bring them back. Yeah. So, yeah. So, but yep, I will send you some pictures. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is Valerie Brown. I'd like to know how we get rid of Johnson grass. Ooh, great one. I like that one. <laughs> Y'all have had such good questions. Um, yeah, I hate Johnson grass. <laughs> so, hmm. And I know that uh, herbicides are a very um, kind of sensitive topic but when you're trying to do restoration work and basically like prairie recreation especially in western kentucky west tennessee where the seed bank is gone in these row crop scenarios um that's when you have so many invasive problems like johnson grass it's rhizomous and so it spreads super easily and the only way to really get rid of it is to spray it 
with like a grass selective herbicide and you can do that where it won't hurt wildflowers if they're in that area mm -hmm. um but yeah so it, um it's called clethodim or select okay sorry my husband's asking me a question clethodim um, yeah. mm -hmm. i can email you the herbicide label if you want it oh perfect yeah 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 all right, you can send it to me and then I can share it with you. Yeah, it'd be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know yeah. we've had a patch of Johnston. We, we keep it mowed, which helps. Mm -hmm. It does. It, yeah. And we dig it out when we get a chance and we make mm -hmm. sure it doesn't go to seed. So, yeah. Are, and you can smother it. Mm -hmm. That's another thing is just keeping the seed heads clipped, but Small that patch. also doesn't. Yeah. 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 But that won't get rid of it altogether. It's kind of like a combination of both. You know. Yeah, I need to need to multi prong attack on that. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Hmm. Started looking it up a little, and um, I really only have one plant I can see the base. The other purple cone flowers are kind of in the middle of the. I got a seed mix from brownstone, mm -hmm. so, but. Yeah, I noticed they'll bloom, look really great, and then, you know, the purple petals will kind of shrivel up. And um, I probably need to just take a sample over to UK Extension. Yeah, are, are you thinking you you've got like a some something going on with your soil or something like? Uh, well, what you're worried about. I don't, I don't know what, I read yeah. a few articles, there's like seven or eight diseases of cone flowers. Oh, okay. And the one, you're supposed to remove the whole plant and the roots. Huh. That's when the base leaves are brown. I think uh -huh. that's like rot and something else. So I know, I, without photos or, but I, is that common, like, with, no, no, I tell you the one that I see with um, mutations is the black eyed Susan uh, that I see that a lot y'all might have. Uh, it's such a hardy species and you, sometimes it can be weedy, to be honest, like, you know, get too thick and in places. But yeah, it, it has these strange mutations um, as a result of pesticides or herbicides, but I've never noticed that on purple coneflower. That's, that's odd. In this little prairie spot, um, I, put, I dug up some of the little blue stem, and I think it's Indian grass, and kind of put it in a different area. But so I don't have the option to burn. I live in a neighborhood. Sure, but, sure. Am I supposed to like trim those back every couple of years or I, I haven't really done much with them. Yeah. Do you feel like it's getting too thick? No. I mean, I just started this like three years ago, so I don't, um, yeah, I just, I mean, I've grown ornamental grasses in the past and you know, those you always trim back. Yeah. Spring. I didn't know if I was supposed to be doing that with the native grasses no you don't have to um okay. you know one of you mentioned something about raking that's something that you could do if you can't burn just for kind of rake it out okay. yeah I mean, yeah yeah i mean i don't know what your uh you know what your landscape situation is but the only thing you wouldn't want is for like the thatch, depending on how much you have to um, get too thick around it from like the dead leaves from the previous year, if you're wanting other species to thrive around it. Oh, um, if that okay. makes sense, which is why you can rake, you know, if that starts to happen, but you don't have to trim them. Okay. So um, I have some pink mooly grasses. Would those benefit from being burned? Yeah. Okay. Because they're looking kind of kind of ratty at the bottom. Yeah, I th and that's a great point too. Just know that you know there are so many 
actual true native warm season grasses. It's not just the most common ones that we're thinking of, like the ones that have been talk talked about a lot, big blue, little blue, Indian grass, switchgrass, just like the mully grasses, uh, fall panicum, uh, deer tongue panicum. I mean, you know, there are a ton of them. So, and there, a lot of them are beneficial. I, I, I stress that a lot. Cause like, I don't want people to get into this. Even my fellow coworkers will sometimes, I don't want to say get in a rut, but like they, they forget like drop seeds, tall drop seed, prairie drop seed, um, side of grandma. Those are great. So. Yeah. And those are relatively small grasses. If you've got yep. like a small garden. Yes. If y'all don't want to do tall, like really tall prairie species. Yeah. The little blue is great. Split beard blue stem. Um, like I said, deer tongue, if it's a little wetter, fall panicum, those mully grasses, any of the drop seeds inside oats grandma, th those are all great. Really pretty for landscaping. Oh, and then the other one, there is a company, a native seed vendor out of Southern Missouri, which I know is a little bit far, but they're called Hamilton Native Outpost. And in the past, they have sold um, oat poverty grass or poverty oat grass. That one is so pretty. That's the one that you see in like woodlands and savannas and it'll have like the little curly dried up leaves at the base. Anyway, that one's really neat to landscape with too. I'd like to put a plug in right now for the um, prairie at Lost River Cave. It is gorgeous. Um, they planted it with round seed, a round seed mix, oh, probably three, three or four years ago. And uh -huh. it's in full bloom and it's just yellow and blue and white and all kinds of uh -huh. rattlesnake master. And it's just a gorgeous prairie right in the middle of uh, Bowling Green. So wow. if you get a chance, um go walk the trail around lost river cave right and it's right beside the prairie and even i'm um, driving along um like cave mill road you can just look over and it's just like breathtaking it's so pretty right now that's awesome I, i've got a brand new co-worker that's working her her new office and that's the office isn't new but she's new and she's based out of russellville in logan county and um I just talked to her today and I will tell her to go over there because she's yeah. eager to say yes. Yeah. So uh, it's Southern Indiana and then um, like barely into Southern Ohio, like pretty much all of Appalachia, um, Southern New Jersey where those Pine Barrens are um, and even like uh parts of pennsylvania that's that's like the but you don't get up to new york no mm -hmm. okay and that's and just so y'all know like that's all based on uh eco region sure. like plant you know plant communities that are most similar with what we define as a southern grassland i know um this has been marvelous thank you so much i've learned quite a lot and uh it was um just eager to go out yeah. and start, start planting some some grasses and hoping to get yeah some yeah well thank you for having me but y'all right. have been great thank you so much I hope to meet you in person sometime and thank yes you i would love that green. i love bowling green love oh, that so area right. we'll look yeah. for you okay. yeah okay come see, the, prairie. Prairie. Come see come the lost river prairie. cave prairie it's worth come a trip right. i sure will yeah <laughs> all right thank you <laughs> thank y'all have a good night thank you. good night y'all too